We're here with Dan Armstrong. Dan is a novelist, the editor of Mud City Press, and a local food advocate. He's also a staff member and the writer for the Southern Willamette Valley Bean and Grain Project. Dan, thanks for being with us here today. Well, it's my pleasure, Kevin. Thank you for uh, inviting me to join in. Absolutely. I've enjoyed your writings uh, largely on matters of food security. And I think we have a video here that gets into some of that, what you're doing with the Bean and Grain Project. So we're going to set the stage by playing a short four-minute informational video about the Southern Willamette Valley Bean and Grain Project. And we'll come back and have a chat with you. Okay. Sounds good. The essential principles of the, of the Bean and Grain Project is to increase the diversity of what we're growing in this valley and to increase the quantity of food products that we're growing in this valley and to steadily build up the infrastructure to support that food production so that it can be sold and consumed here. We are in the situation right now um, of cheap oil not being available and getting more and more expensive. and. Uh, the availability of oil is what's allowed our food system to run at the cheap level that it's run at and have all the international and national shipping going back and forth. So we need to localize as much of our food as we can. We actually have a magical valley here in the Willamette Valley. We actually have ideal climatic conditions for growing most food crops. We've had uh, regular farm meetings. Initially not too many farmers showed up, but they we've had a, a collapse in the grass seed market. So there's plenty of farmers out there that used to be grass seed growers that are looking for alternatives. The grass seed market tanked a few years ago and it's potentially much more profitable to grow food crops like beans and grains and edible seeds than it is to grow ornamentals like grass seed. We're redesigning the way food systems work and food is the source of life and it's the basis of community. And so we're really re-engineering human relationships and the way community relationships work. How do we get our entire community taking ownership of the food that they eat and ownership in a way that they want to support the farmer growing it and they want to support the soil on the farm and do what's best for it because that's where their food comes from. I think there's a feeling of of connection that comes from participating in such a thing where there's an idealistic vision and a purpose that brings people together that normally would never sit at the same table and yet we're pursuing this goal which requires each of us to collaboratively participate. This might be a way to create jobs. On one hand, uh, by producing more food, and especially if it's organic, it's going to involve a little bit more hands-on, a little more labor. But on a larger scale, if we start processing, we're going to have some processing plants. There's, again, more jobs, higher wages. In changing the uh, food system from sort of an industrialized macro economy into this localized micro economy, that's going to require a lot more labor and a lot more helping hands. I still think it's small pockets of folks that are really willing to lay out the cash to pay more. But as, but as uh, Willow Coberly was saying, when she just takes a moment to tell people why her wheat costs a little more than this other wheat, they get it. What we do is organically farmed and there's no chemicals, plus we pay a fair wage to our employees and we supply medical insurance. Um, and we, because it's, there's no chemical application, we have a humongous um, overhead as far as um, manual labor on the field. And so as soon as they realize that it's a local dollar being spent local to support a local family, um, th they jump right in. I'm old enough I should be thinking about retirement, but I think we're more enthused and excited about these kind of projects right now than, than been uh, in a long time. But, you know, I see it long term as, as hopefully a key to the long term viability of, of our farm. Uh, and, uh, and also uh, the community. We've got to have a food system that is more stable that people can count on year after year after year and you know who's involved in it. And the farmers, I've seen some of these ryegrass guys come to conferences where consumers start talking with them, and these guys have never been treated this way. They're heroes. And, and that changes their whole attitude about going out and doing the stuff we do hour after hour out here planting the soil, you know, um, taking on the risks that we take on because we know we got people out there that are backing us and want this stuff. And that's huge. That's a huge, huge change in everybody's consciousness and it makes all this possible. Dan, thank you. That's really wonderful initiative that you have 
working down there, it seems like it's really helping to uh, rebuild the local cultural commons. And a lot of people may not understand why we would need a local food system, especially in this country where it seems like our food system is just fine. People get their food, what's, what's the deal? <laughs> so I guess the real basic question would be, why rebuild a local food system? Well, I think that's the first question people often ask. And I think uh, we'd start by saying perhaps our food system is broken. Uh, we have several concerns, uh, we might call them food security concerns, that we would like that uh, the current system doesn't really address. Uh, the, the most obvious one is the problem we have in our country with obesity and the way that people eat. That's basically the result of a, a large corporate food system so that food health is part of one of the concerns for food security, it goes back again to the food system. We're also concerned about the healthiness of the food, thinking the closer it is to you, the healthier it is, the less travel it's taken, it hasn't been refrigerated for two weeks before you get it. Another concern we have with food security is the price of petroleum. I know if anyone's been watching the market, the price of petroleum has climbed from about $12 in 1998 $12 a barrel, that is, in 1998, did $145 in 2008, and now hovers between $85 and $95, but that, that petroleum plays uh, hugely into our, our production of food, not only for the transportation of it, but the production of it, and in particular, having food closer uh, to where you're eating it means a little less price is involved in the cost of getting it to you. And I foresee in the future the price of petroleum only going up, adding to the cost of food if it's coming from a long distance. So having it close by is a good idea. Another concern we have is for a catastrophe, maybe like what we saw at Katrina in uh, New Orleans, or even the wildfires we've had in California, where there really is no uh, local supply of food. The uh, food on the shelves of your grocery store will probably last about three or four days if nothing new is added. And in the case of the Willamette Valley, if you can imagine that we get all of our food up and down Interstate 5, it comes up from California, sometimes uh, from the east also. But if we were to have an ice storm in Oregon, and that I-5 was shut down for a week, 10 days, two weeks, we'd suddenly be short on food. It would be smart to have some food on hand. That's another reason for having a local food system. We're also consumed, concerned with uh, increasing unemployment uh, for those that do not have enough money to buy their food. And we rely on uh, international, uh, national systems to get food, uh, food banks, so forth, get the food to those that need it. If we're having a local food system, if we have distributors and processors and people growing food here, we're likely to have more on hand, either for gleaning or for, for contributions to our local food banks, another case of having it close on hand. We're importing 98% of our food here to this valley. That happens to be the case throughout the Actually, in the, the average for importing food to any region in the United States is 99% is import, less than 1% locally produced. And that includes all of the farm regions, including our own. And that is absolutely absurd. Our effort is to diversify what we grow, particularly in the grains and the beans and the staples. But also the fruits and vegetables. And what that means is we start using our food shed, in other words, our valley, to first grow to the demands of the local populace. By doing that, we, we force ourselves to diversify our crops. And the diversification is good for the soil. It's good for the land. It means we rotate our crops in a way that builds the soil. We mix in the legumes, the nitrogen-fixing legumes, with other crops like buckwheat, which can add phosphorus to the, to the soil. And, I, and then we rotate that in through with the other crops. But essentially, it becomes not only a market thing, but it's also an environmental thing. The difference between growing one crop everywhere and a diversified variety uh, everywhere else. What dynamics are you working with in regards to the established commercial market, politics, and even consumer consciousness? Well, I think we're essentially trying to reverse the paradigm. And I would say that because in the normal instance, farmers grow first for the global market, seeking out the crop they grow for the most profit. Then next, they grow for the regional market. And lastly, they grow to local appetites and, and the populace. 
We'd like to see that reversed. We'd like to see the farmers first answer the demand of the local populace to create the diversity. Then what's left over from what they grow there goes out to the regional market. And then if there's some other crop that we can still grow in excess and, and not eat all of it, we send that out to the global market. So that's, that's essentially a complete paradigm reverse. And then if you look at it very closely, it actually becomes a political statement and how we run the world and how we manage our resources, particularly our food. So it is a consciousness thing. And more than anything else, try to make particularly your local populace. And like you said, Kevin, it could be anywhere in the world, particularly anywhere that's, that has a fertile, fertile farmland. But the idea is focus on buying what you can from your local farmers, and they will respond by growing more. I think that's really the consciousness shift we're asking for. So what other ways can you think of for someone to be able to support this initiative in their community? Well, strictly in our community, you, you really would just simply want to buy what what's being offered in terms of the food. You know, uh, again, as our independent project has done, this well, Southern Willamette Bean and Grain Project, we've asked the farmers to change what they grow. And we've had several takers, several large farmers have decided to stop growing commercial uh, conventional grass seed grown with uh, uh, herbal herbicides and pesticides and start transitioning to organic farmland, organic growing, organic methods, and producing organic food. That's actually happening. But they're taking a risk to do it. They're trying to change their own market strategy. And that doesn't happen overnight. It will take three to five years at a bare minimum. But the way to speed that up and take some of the risk from the farmers is to have the populace respond by buying. Now, we do know that those local products, especially when they aren't grown at the scale you might in the case of wheat in the Midwest, or when we're not growing in terms of scale, and the price is up. Same with organic. A lot of the, in the case of the beans, a lot of the work has to be done by hand. So you go into the grocery store and you look at that tomato from South America, and you look at the tomato from the Willamette Valley, and believe it or not, the one from further away, for the moment, is cheaper. We believe that as the price of petroleum goes up, that advantage will disappear. But it's better to be prepared. And what we would say is, by contributing to the local farmers' efforts, diminishing their risk by buying that food, you're really strengthening your community. And if you're spending 50 cents more a pound or 25 cents more a pound, you're actually, that money, on one hand, will strengthen the community because it gives us some resilience in terms of our food security. But and it also is money that will be recycled within our own community. And we believe that this food system rebuilding, including the infrastructure that has to come with it, the mills, the, the processing plants, will add jobs to the local community, it will build resilience within the community, and it will add, like I've said before, it will give us some sort of food security, really against all odds. I know we can go much, much further, and we really appreciate you coming on today and, and sharing this exciting and just absolutely requisite initiative.